It's a great honor to be here. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction and for all the staff that made this possible. Um, and thank you for taking some time out to come and uh, listen to me. So let me give you a little, little bit of background um, what I'm going to do. So I have been working with a theory of social practice for a few years now. Um, and it's kind of been one of those accounts that is you know, play, lots of placeholders, not sure if this is the right account. I just needed something. Um, and I'm not going to be able to fill in all the gaps and answer all the questions at this point. Um, but I do feel as though now I have much more to say to motivate that particular account of social practices. And so I'm drawing together some things that I've written elsewhere, but also some new work to kind of to provide a better foundation for this idea of social practice. Now, many of you probably are familiar with my work because I work a lot on racism and sexism and other forms of uh, structural oppression. And so in this talk, I'm going to be talking about social practice and what, in a theoretical sense or a metaphysical sense, a, a, a social practice might be. But I'm then going to move to uh, an application of it in, the connection, in connection with racism. Can people in the back hear me all right? You all right? OK, so if you, if you find that I have uh, start, started to speak too, too softly, raise your hand or wave at me or something. Also, there's a handout. Everyone should have a handout. And I'm going to read bits of the handout, and I'm going to then talk some bits of it as well. But if you, if you, you, know, if you lose track you know, and you, you can't hear me, just let me know. OK, so start with methodological preliminaries. So the question that I'm asking, what is a social practice, is not intended here as a traditional philosophical question that can be answered a priori from reflection or introspection on our linguistic judgments. So you might ask, what am I doing? Right? How do we do metaphysics? Or how do we do this kind of metaphysics if we're not doing it that way? So I'm coming from a, a, a very complicated and diverse tradition of critical theory. And I'm not going to try and explain what critical theory is today beyond just saying that it, the task of critical theory is to provide resources for social movements seeking social justice. Right? That's a very rough crude, vague, wide uh, stroke uh, description of critical theory. So for example, critical theory offers accounts of race, racism, and racial oppression that illuminate the issues that confront the anti-racist activist. So an anti-racist activist will often need to figure out what is racism anyway? Is there such a thing as race? Do we try when we're combating racism to get people to give up the concept of race? Or how do we proceed? And the critical theorist, among others, is going to be trying to answer those questions. OK, so a critical disability theory will do the same for disability. Uh, feminist, critical feminist theory will do the same for gender. There are lots of different critical theories that are working on different parts of this project. So what do we do when we engage in a question like this as a critical theorist? Here's a quote from Tommy Shelby on your handout. Social critics don't merely systematize common sense or popular scientific findings. Social critics seek to inform and possibly shape public opinion with clear and careful thinking, well-established facts, and moral insight. They will, of course, draw on and engage both common sense and scientific thought, but they do so without taking a slavish attitude toward either. So you'll find critical race theorists, for example, will typically argue that race is socially constructed, and that seems very striking or surprising to people who have a, a traditional conception of race. But the critical theorist is not saying, oh, I must have gotten it wrong because it doesn't correspond with everyday opinions, because that's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to just systematize everyday opinions. We're trying to draw on science, moral theory, other kinds of considerations to come up with an adequate theory of race that is going to be a tool in the search for social justice, in the quest for social justice. OK, so then um, what we're trying to do is shift our understanding in that kind of a case, in the case of race, shift our understanding of racial categories from being inevitable and immutable because built into nature to being contingent and dependent on human practices. And as a result, certain justifications of racial oppression are rendered impotent. So that's just an example of how a critical theorist might go along. And you say, race is not naturally written into our genetic structure. 
So it's not something that we have to live with, we could do without race. And that's something that critical theorist is going to help us understand. So why then, this on the handout as well, should a, critical social, should a social critic be interested in social practices? Here are a few reasons why. First bullet, practices are a site of socially organized agency. They're a nexus where individual agency is enabled and constrained by social factors. I'll say a little more about that. Secondly, practices produce, distribute, and organize things taken to have value, including material goods, time, knowledge, status, authority or power, health and well-being, and security. And moreover, practices are, at least in some sense, up to us, so are a potential site for change. So think about a social practice like a public lecture. So this is a social practice that you're all familiar with, right? And it distributes something. It distributes, among other things, airtime. I got it. I got the airtime. You all don't. I, I get to talk. And I've noticed that none of you are like up here sitting at the front. Probably when you walked in, you never even thought for a second that you would take one of these chairs, right? So this is a practice. We've organized ourselves in to coordinate, to coordinate around the distribution of a good. In this case, I hope it might be knowledge, you know, or purported knowledge, or you know, something that we're trying thinking might be, or just airtime, as I said. So we're organizing ourselves, and we know how to do it, right? Because we've all been in an academic environment long enough that we've been socialized into academia. You kind of know what you're supposed to do. And so that is a paradigm kind of social practice that you all just enacted when you walked in the room. OK, so in short, practices are sites where autonomy is exercised. You were autonomous when you came in this room, but is also constrained because although you were autonomous, you made choices within a certain set of options, right? You, the options were already kind of shaped by the practice. So your options were to sit out there and not to sit up here. Your options are, you know, to be quiet and write or, you know, be quietly on your cell phone, not to talk out loud, you know, things like that. So you have autonomy, but that autonomy is shaped by the constraints of the practice. But also the, the practice is, is not only constraining, but for me especially, it's enabling, right? The practice enables me to talk about my work, to engage with you, to learn things from you that is going to make my work better. OK, so practices are sites where autonomy is exercised, but also constrained, where goods are created, perhaps knowledge is created and shared, if I have knowledge to share with you or not. And so we're central to issues of social justice, because in social justice, we're concerned about coordination, about the distribution of goods, and such like that. And there are also sites where we might have leverage to make a positive difference. So you'll find in some, I know maybe you do this in some classrooms, that this format for teaching isn't always the best format. So we put you know, our students in circles or find other ways to engage them. So this practice, although common, isn't inevitable. We could do it a different way. All right, so I gave you the example of the public lecture to start with, but let's think about other practices that are, are fairly common. The timing of meals, right? So around here in the United States and in England and most parts of Europe, there's three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and we organize our lives around those, right? You organize lunch breaks you under, or dinner parties and such like that. But there are other cultures that don't have breakfast, have their main meal in the middle of the day, you know, have nothing in the late evening. You know, they organize, and so, and so their organization of business, of work life, of, child, of parenting, of school, etc., look kind of different because their meals are organized differently, right? So a whole structure of social life is kind of organized around something as simply as the timing of meals. Uh, cuisine, of course, so what you eat um, is closely, you know, how you eat it. Do you eat it with your hands? Do you eat it with chopsticks? Do you eat it with a uh, fork and knife? Do you turn your fork over in your left hand and put it in upside down, <laughs> as we would say? Um, or do you, you know, you turn it in your right hand? You know, these American, British things, you know all that. Um, so those are different kinds of practices. Clothing styles, um, do you wear a sari or do you wear trousers or do you wear a skirt, etc. 
Those are all examples of different kinds of practices. Now, there are interconnected practices, so if you think about the timing of meals and the cuisine, that's going to get a whole set of interconnected practices that eventually are connected to things like food production and, and trucking systems and train systems and, and transportation, how you move things from farm to table, and then uh, uh, businesses that sell the foods and, and package the foods, right? So you have a whole food production distribution system, and you also have in that traditions of cuisines, do you, what kind of food do you cook? What kind of spices do you need for cooking? Do you boil it or do you steam it? Do you need certain kinds of you know, equipment? Do you need an idli steamer because you make idli? Or do you not need an idli steamer? You only need a pot and a pan, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have garbage, right? Trash, garbage, uh, recycling, all of this. So you can see that these practices are connected and form what I like to think of as structures. Right? So structures are going to be these systems of interdependent practices. And they will include, well, I just talked about the food system, but transportation systems, education systems, and market systems where that involve exchange and labor. OK, so that's to get us started. We're just interested in, uh, we're interested in understanding these phenomena, these social practices. Um, and the structures that they compose because we're interested in the distribution of things of value. Okay, so let's move to phenomena. First, practices provide a stage setting for action. In two concepts of rules, Rawls argues that there's an important distinction between summary rules that offer generalizations about past actions or choices and practice rules that define a meaningful form of action, for example, making a promise. He argues that practices such as promising are defined by a set of rules that are prior to the behavior and states of mind of the participants, and in that sense, they do provide a stage setting for action. So when you know, the rules of promising are not just a summary of, you know, people tend to say, you know, tend after they promise to do the thing that they promise. Look at this pattern of behavior that we're just summarizing here. That's not, that's not what the institution of promising is. That's not a, a rule, a summary rule. It's not how we govern ourselves in relation to promising. Rather, promising sets up a structure, a structure of expectations, etc. cetera. So, so the stage setting for action. They render our action meaningful. Are saying I promise, it becomes meaningful with respect to that rule, they constitute reasons for action. So for example, when I promise my friend that I'll take her to the airport at an early on Sunday morning, right? Um, I, at early in Sunday morning, I don't feel like getting up. I had a really fun Saturday night. I'm really tired, but I have reason to get up and take my friend in spite of the fact that I don't feel like it, in spite of the fact that it might not be in my interest or whatever, uh, all things considered, but I have a reason to do it because she's my friend and I made her a promise. Okay, so what does it mean exactly to say the practice is logically prior to the behavior and the states of mind of the participants? And this is quote is on the handout. In the case of actions specified by practices, it is logically possible to perform them outside, it's logically impossible to perform them outside the stage setting provided by those practices. For unless there is a practice, and unless the requisite properties are fulfilled, whatever one does, whatever movement one makes, will fail to count as a form of action which the practice specifies. So you can't, this is often in the examples, you know, you, you, you can run across, you can kick a ball into a goal, but it doesn't count as scoring a goal unless you're in the game of football or soccer like that. Okay, so some practices are highly institutionalized and ritualized, and they constitute reasons. So for example, religious practices. Akna performs a ritual with maize because this is a way to worship. The terms of the practice constitute her reason. She may also believe that performing the ritual will have good effects and that others will respect her if she does. But even if that's not true, even if it won't have good effects, even if people won't respect her, she has reason to perform the ritual because she is committed to the practice and this is what the practice requires. This action may be also constitutive of her role, her identity, 
and who she is. So she may end up in a situation, suppose Akna immigrates, and her ritual is thought to be pagan or anti-Christian or whatever and in the United States that's you know thought to be bad or whatever and so it's not going to be good for her to practice it etc but she might say I don't care this is who I am this is what I do I I perform this ritual right so the identity can get closely tied up with the practices that constitute our social milieu okay however and this is also on the handout, practices can be more or less explicit, transparent, rule-governed, or intentional. I engage in the practice of playing fetch with my dog. Infants engage with adults, non-human animals engage with each other, and humans engage with non-human animals and social practices. So I would like to say, you know, my playing fetch with my dog, that's a social practice, you know? Or, or, or children playing together, Those are, they have all kinds of social practices. I actually think that some animals have inter-animal social practices. So you can have dogs play with each other. I don't know if you know, I'm a dog person, but anyway. So the dogs kind of train each other how to play, and they have some signaling and that, that they do with each other, and, what, and little puppies need to be socialized into that. We also know that there are all kinds of animals that have a culture in the sense that they transmit through teaching their offspring how to do certain things, like how to use a stick to get ants out of the hole. Okay, so on the less explicit end, so I, you know, here I'm trying to push us to also consider the less explicit end, practices are certain regularities or patterns in behavior that are guided by shared schemas acquired through primitive so forms of social mentality, including cognition, affect, experience, etc. That is, by thinking and feeling that has shaped by been shaped by contact with others who were tacitly taken to have goals and to pursue them. So I'm attributing here a very kind of weak sense of inten you know, intentionality or mind uh, to kinds of animals in the sense that there's quite a bit of evidence that lots of animals can interpret others, both humans and other animals, as pursuing an end or a goal and trying to take a means to that and interfere with it or not. How would they hunt after all? They've got to, you know, wolves hunt. They not only, when you hunt something, you've got to try and figure out where it's gonna go and why it's gonna go there as opposed to here. And if you hunt in a pack, you better know how to do that because you need to coordinate with others. Okay, so that's on the, on the, the primitive end. On the rationalistic end of the spectrum, the patterns in behavior are guided by highly sophisticated forms of social cognition and intentional agency. And these, for example, enable us to play games, write constitutions, you know, have judicial systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But all of that, I think, depends on the more basic shaping of interaction. Now, here's this little round bullet. The round bullets are places where I wanna say this is a kind of message of this section. So this at the bottom of that first column, this suggests that anything we might reasonably count as social agency takes place within a domain structured by shared schemas for interpreting and coordinating with others. I'll say more about schemas as we go along, but let's talk now about coordination. So here's a quote. A lot of the work on this primitive form of social cognition I'm getting from uh, Ted Zawitsky's book, Mind Shaping, which I highly recommend, excellent book. He's a philosopher and cognitive scientist. He says, human beings are distinguished from other mammals by their extreme sociality. Because of this, solving problems of coordination with our fellows is our most pressing ecological task. So in order to coordinate, we need terms, shared terms of understanding and uh, ways to facilitate our coordination, right? Those terms are going to be those terms that are shared that we can use to coordinate. Ostention, pointing to something and saying, look at that, you know, how do you know? It could be anything. What am I talking about when I say look at that? But for those of you in the back can't see, I was, I was pointing at this, but I was supposed to be pointing in a way that was kind of ambiguous, like down at the table where there are lots of things. Was I pointing at this particular molecule or was I pointing at this smudge or whatever? No, we are all kind of programmed to think, aha, the most salient thing there is the, 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 um, the Royal Institute of Philosophy brochure. That's the most salient thing there. And so that possibility of ostension depends on 
are already having saliencies and, and ways of tracking things in the world um, that I think in particular are, you know, there may be some natural, you know, we are good at bound, our, 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 our visual system looks at boundaries and can track boundaries, but we also need to be socialized to some extent about what are the objects of salience. And coordination requires that we attend to and respond to the right signals, filtering out the noise to do our part in the plan. So when I say I promise blah, 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 you know, well, I'm making funny faces and I'm wearing weird clothes and you know, all of these sorts of things. What is it in that sort of experience of me at that moment that is the taking me to have made a promise? You know, we've got to have some way of sort that, sorting that out. So as it says on the handout, culture defines the terms of coordination for a group. And William Sewell, he's a, a, a social historian who's kind of also does some sociology. He captures the idea, culture may be thought of as a network of semiotic relations cast across society. So he continues, this implies that users of culture will form a semiotic community in the sense that they will recognize the same set of oppositions or meanings and therefore be capable of engaging in mutually meaningful symbolic action. To use the ubiquitous linguistic analogy, they will be capable of using the grammar of the semiotic system to make understandable utterances. So we're pretty familiar with this in the context of philosophy of language or any study of language, but what semiotics does is it says, look, this is going on all the time. This, this podium has a meaning. It has a meaning with respect to the academic world, right? And I knew the minute I walked in here that I was supposed to stand behind this, right? How did I know that? Well, because we all in the academic world, you know, you learn these sorts of meanings. You learn how, how to navigate them. Okay, so there are two ways in which culture can facilitate coordination. First way, shaping our cognition, perception, attention, and memory. And I've already given you some examples of that. But just to say a little more, concepts organize the flow of experience by focusing our attention and facilitating inferences. So concepts, you have the concept of a podium, then you know, that's going to help us sort of focus on that, pay attention to that, and draw inferences. That's, con concepts are good for that. Cultural scripts and tropes add tools for prediction and organizing memory. So the script is, the speaker stands here, you know, walks around a little bit, but not too much, blah, 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 blah. So that script, you can predict a lot of what I'm going to do because you have that cultural script. And later, you're going to remember things in part because you've attended to certain things, you have the script, you can place the things in the script and remember. Paul Taylor's recent work, uh, uh, Black is Beautiful, strongly recommended, uh, a book in black aesthetics, highlights the ways that social meanings not only constrain what's considered possible or intelligible, but also our perception. So he says, race belongs, this is a quote on the handout, race belongs to the manifold of social reality and helps structure our experience, our immediate experience of the world. Often enough, we directly perceive racial phenomena. We just see race the way we just see home runs and rude gestures. Black people look dangerous or unreliable or like bad credit risks. And there is quite a bit of evidence in the psychology of in uh, and, and the psychology literature and experiments about implicit bias, et cetera, that that's the case. So cultural tools shape the experiences and expectations of a community so we're roughly on the same page and so inhabit the same social world. So that's the first way that culture facilitates coordination by shaping cognition, experience, perception, et cetera. But a second way that culture aids coordination is by taking the concepts, scripts, and meanings to be normative for members of the group. It's not just that we're socialized to think and feel and whatever in similar ways, but we learn what is the right way to think and feel, etc. So when encountering others who are similarly socialized, we begin with the assumption that they will do things the right way and feel entitled to criticize them if they don't. So think about when you're driving a car, there you are on the road, and you don't even, you don't have to try to get inside the head of the other person and try to think, okay, now what does that person see from this point of view and how are they going to do this and where are they going and are they going to do this? What you know is they're going to stop at the stop sign, right? Of course they might not, 
But pretty often, pretty much most of the time, they do, right? Why? Because that's the right thing to do. Because there's a law that says that's what you're supposed to do. So what happens in our social milieu is that we, we can sort of fast track a lot of interpretation of others that would be really intractable. If I had to try and interpret what was going on in the minds of the person in the car, I can't even see that person. How do I know what's going on in their minds? I would be in bad shape trying to drive. Imagine on a busy street. What happens is I just make the assumption people are going to do the right thing. And of course, there are accidents. People don't always do the right thing. And then we get really pissed off, right? We get pissed off because they didn't do it the right way. And so there's going to be the way that the coordination is organized around these norms and laws and rules, etc. OK, so when encountering others, uh, oh, right, I already said that. We're going to assume they do the right way and feel entitled to criticize them if they don't. And this provides incentives for individuals to internalize and conform their behavior to the practices. Because if you don't do it the right way, you're going to get a ticket, or you're going to be criticized, or you're going to be laughed at, etc., etc. So this is a kind of norming effect in, in keeping us on the same page. Because remember, the goal is coordination. And so we're trying to stay on the same page. And we, we interpret each other using you know, what's on that page. And if people go off that page, we punish them. OK, so next uh, open bullet. Uh, thus far, we've seen that practices A, provide a stage setting for action that gives us roles to occupy and reasons to act. And they do so by drawing on shared and normatively laden meanings and schemas for experiencing and interpreting the world. All right, take a deep breath. I know I'm kind of going a little fast because I've got a little too much to do. So. But hopefully it's not incomprehensible because you've got a lot of it on your page and you can go back and deep breath. <sighs> All right. So one might worry. So this is uh, section C on fragmentation. One might worry, however, that on this view, agency is diminished and we're no better than cultural robots. But culture is not a hegemonic system but it's a frame for agency. So this goes back to some of the things we talked about. Again, we'll come back to that. Anyway, it's a frame for agency. So there's two ways of thinking about this idea of a frame, or perhaps two ways in which culture serves as a frame. I'm leaning now to think that it, the culture kind of works in different kinds of ways, and we're not, we shouldn't like try to make it all one thing. So here are two things that, that cult, ways that culture provides a frame. So Anne Swidler suggests that, quote, culture influences action by shaping a repertoire or toolkit of habits, skills, and styles from which people construct, quote, strategies of action. Anne Swidler is a sociologist. Um, so the idea here is that when you talk about culture, I mean, for a long time it was like American culture or British culture or Indian culture or whatever. You know, the anthropologists and the sociologists and other social theorists have kind of given up on that. Doesn't, that doesn't really work so well anymore. Um, uh, and it had a lot of bad stuff going along with it. Anyway, so, so now the idea is that, well, do we give up the idea of culture entirely? And so within this tradition, people say, no, no, don't give up the idea of culture entirely, but just fragment it, right? We've all got the tools for, for getting around, but it's a kind of grab bag of tools. And we pick up certain tools for certain purposes, these tools of culture. So certain scripts. You know, there isn't one hegemonic script of what women do, and we all are just programmed. OK, now we're all going to do that. You know, that's not how it works. There are bunches of scripts, and there are bunches of concepts. There are bunches of all this. And we pick, and we kind of mess with them, put them together. So it, that doesn't mean that we're all making it up from scratch, because the culture provides these options for us. So Jack Balkan, uh, Jack Balkan is a, a legal theorist at Yale has a great book called Cultural Software that I'm drawing on here. He emphasizes the tools um, are not necessarily designed for a single purpose, but have multiple purposes and are often the source of new purposes. So Balkan borrows Levi-Strauss's notion of a bricoleur, the odd job man who uses whatever tools are available in new and unexpected ways. We should not assume a culture is coherent or those who employ it, the tools have shared ends and they act in solidarity with each other. Symbolic systems ca cast a wide net over social relations. And the meaning of a symbol always transcend any particular context because the symbol is freighted with its usages in a multitude of other instances of the social practice. So there isn't just, OK, we're going to 
give necessary and sufficient conditions for the meaning, so to speak, the social meaning of this, and fix it once and for all, because we're all playing with these meanings and using these tools, and as we use them, we can change the meanings because we use them in slightly new ways. Now, I think that a lot of this is true of language as well. Um, I'm not making that claim about language here. I'm making it about you know, semiotic systems, which are not just words and phrases and such like that, but are the, the meanings of the things in our, in our mil social milieu. But I do think that one of the problems that philosophers of language have had along the way is they have this tendency to say, fix the meaning. What is the meaning? We're going to define it here once and for all. Uh, that's, not so, that's, that's not so plausible to me. OK, so because it's always we're borrowing and, and, and playing with these meanings, culture is a site of contestation and disruption, and it's open to transformation. So that's one. So one way that culture helps us here is it provides us tools, these tools like our concepts and this and that and the other. Um, but another is that culture provides vectors for action. And here's a little bit about vectors. So Sarah Richardson, she is in social studies of science at Harvard, suggests that social vectors provide, quote, forms of causality that are conduit-like rather than strictly cause and effect, directional rather than distinctly determinative, and relational rather than cleanly linear. Social structures provide, in effect, a topology on which specific upon which specific causal factors interact to produce probabilistic effects. So cultural scripts and narratives create valleys in the topology along which agency easily flows. Although it may be easier to flow along the valley, we have choices to climb the peaks instead. Okay, so, you know, like the, the valley, you know, wearing gender appropriate clothing for, you know, that's a valley, right? So we have these norms about what's the right thing to wear if you're male or you're female, what's the right thing to wear if you're young or you're old, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, you, you, there's a valley there, there's a topology of social space. You go along the valley, things will be relatively easy for you, but you're not forced, you're not determined to go in that valley because you can choose to do something else. Use a different tool, play with the tool. What, what the tool might be? length of hair, glasses, you know, skirts or pants sort of things. These are all tools that we have for meaning and we can play with those and mean new things. Okay, so open bullet. It would seem then that practices draw on cultural tools to provide paths across the social landscape in ways that facilitate coordination or sometimes disrupt coordination. But how should we understand this notion of a landscape? Can we talk a little bit further about that? So materiality, section D. What things in the world are is never fully determined by the symbolic net we throw over them. This also depends on their pre-existing physical characteristics, the spatial relations in which they occur, the relations of power with which they are invested, their economic value, and of course, the different symbolic meanings they may have, that may have been attributed to them by other actors. The world is recalcitrant to our predications of meaning. That's William Sewell again. The social landscape is malleable, but it's not infinitely so. We coordinate within the constraints that the world, our bodies, and our humanity imposes on us. So the world, we can't fly, right? We need food. There are other sorts of things, and I think that we do have um, some very deep impulses not to destroy each other for fun. I noted at the start that practices orient us not just in relation to each other, but also things, that is, parts of the world that are taken to have value. So now I'm going to talk about an important part of a social practice that occurs together with the schema and in relation to the schema because we want our practices to be grounded in material reality, the material reality of us and our bodies. So let's say, this is on the handout, let's say that something becomes a resource when its value, whether economic, aesthetic, moral, or prudential, is recognized. It becomes thereby a potential site of coordination problem. Access to it is something to be managed because access to resources can be a source of power or pleasure, etc. So 
things come into the world or they exist in the world or whatever and they have value and suddenly, oh gosh, who gets access to that? You know, who wants access to that? Why do we want access to that? How are we going to distribute the access? Do we need to reproduce that thing? Is it naturally occurring or has it been, you know, produced? If we're going to reproduce it, how are we going to reproduce it? These are all serious coordination problems. Many things have the potential to be valued and sometimes we recognize that potential and sometimes we don't. Penicillium fungi were potentially useful to humans before their antibiotic properties were discovered. I just saw this thing in the, in the British Library. There was like drawings and such about the, 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 the discovery of penicillin. It was very cool. Anyway, they were potentially useful to humans before their antibiotic properties were discovered. And eventually human ingenuity and labor transformed and increased the value of the fungus and gave us penicillin. And now there's this big question, who gets access to penicillin? How much do they have to pay for it? Do they get it through the National Health Service or do they have to, et cetera, et cetera. So schemas evolved to enable us to perceive, produce, and organize the resource in interaction with the resource in each other. We can change it and we can get new responses. So our thinking and acting evolve along with the object or artifact. So one of my favorite examples of bulk, and so this is, I think, really important, that, that, value, that values are path dependent, right? They're not just there once and for all in heaven or wherever you think they live. They, they, they develop in response to human activity and human practices. So as one of my favorite lines in Balkan, is he's, talking about, um, he's talking about the appreciation of music. And he says, you know, you could never appreciate rock and roll until electric guitars were invented, right? So there's a new aesthetic, a new value that comes into the world, something to be valued, which is rock and roll. I like rock and roll. I hope you like rock and roll. Anyway, rock and roll, but you couldn't, ha you couldn't ha value rock and roll. There couldn't be that particular kind of aesthetic value until electric guitars were invented and, you know, all the rest. And so there's, so values and things that are valuable are, are dynamic and, and, uh, and come and go with our practices. Um, so another thing I think is a maybe useful example I sometimes use for this uh, notion of a resource is rabbits. Rabbits, bunnies hopping along in the field, doing their thing. And I think of them, though this is, I think it's a terminological question we could discuss, but I don't think it's that important. Let's say that when they're on their own, they're not a resource. They're not a resource, so to speak, for humans. But we apply a schema. Rabbits could be food or a pet or a pelt, right? So that schema shapes our understanding of the rabbit, brings that rabbit into our social world, right? It becomes now a social entity um, because it's now food, that's certainly social, or a pelt, that's certainly social, or a pet. And then that brings with it various appropriate ways of behaving in response to it. So if you come into my house and you see a rabbit and you kill it and eat it, that would be bad because that's my pet, right? And so, but, we, but we, we structure our sense of what the resource is in light of what value we attribute to it. Okay. Um, so this suggests that the social landscape is shaped by multiple determinants. The physical environment, our human needs and capacities, our interpretation of these, and our behavior that draws on the social meanings and other cultural tools. I assumed above that the normativity of social meanings produces a kind of cultural stability, though not rigidity. So I'm going to punish you if you violate the rules, things like that. So there's a certain stability in our culture. Um, uh, but, the fact, but the fact that we rely on cultural schemas to interact not only with each other, but also the world, changes the world to conform to the schemas we bring to it domestication of dogs or horses or, you know, we, we create new kinds of horses and dogs and rabbits and stuff because of the concept of a pet or a, a labor animal, uh, you know, animals that do labor or things like that. So the world comes to conform to the schemas we bring to it. This has, I think, very significant epistemic effects. The schemas we employ to interpret the world are confirmed by the world that they have shaped. For example, and there's a lot of evidence for what I'm going to say, but anyway, the, the, we interpret children as girls and boys and apply gender schemas to them. 
and the gender schemas are institutionalized and internalized and enacted. Girls and boys grew up to be women and men who more or less, in some ways or other, confirm the gender schemas. This is true even if there are some biological determinants of gendered behavior. I'm not going to talk about that. That's, that's, that's outside the, the controversy here. There may, there may not be. But even if there are, men and women are not just you know, biological creatures. We are social creatures. And so it becomes difficult to change the schemas for they appear to have epistemic warrant. So when you look around and you say, hmm, women are better caregivers than men. It's true. We do almost all of it, right? Children, elderly, disabled, etc. And you know what? If you want a caregiver, you're better, you'll be better off to get a woman to do it than a man because the history, the social history of gender has positioned us historically to do this over and over and over and over again. We learn it from our mothers, we learn it from our grandmothers, etc., etc. So it seems like that gender norm is confirmed by the, the social world when in fact it has been that, that regularity has been created by the social world. Okay, so E, explanation and interpretation. This is a kind of longish and complicated section that I might not get into in as much detail as suggested on the handout, but I'll say something about it. Just that, uh, accounts of social practices fall on a continuum between thin and thick conceptions. Here's the thin one. Practices are simply patterns of interaction or regularities in our behavior. The thick one is relevant patterns emerge because participants understand their normative responsibility and act in a certain way. So probably when you walked in the room, you were participating in a pretty thick practice. You understood implicitly probably that you weren't supposed to come up to the front and take the podium and spend an hour talking. Um, but there are these other uh, thin practices, you might want to say, and those are ones that I thought were maybe, you know, when I play fetch with my dog or when dogs play games with each other, or etc. But there also are human practices that are pretty thin. And I want there to be the possibility of, of a full range of thick and thin. So if one adopts a thick conception of practices according to which the existence of a practice depends on shared or complementary uh, intentions, the problem is this leaves no gap between the subjective conceptions of actors and the action patterns that analysis might uncover. So the idea is that if, well, let me go on and I'll read and you'll get the, you'll get the idea. So a social critic will want to allow the theoretical possibility that agents can be confused or misled about the social practices that they enact. And different agents can participate in the same practice with different intentions and different reasons. So this is one of the places where the social critic project is the rubber hits the road. Because up until what I've said now, you know, thin, thick, who cares? But I think if you're engaging in this as a social critic, we need to have the possibility of thin social practices. So here's an example. Um, men offer opening doors for women and not vice versa. Um, Sorry, I, I lost my place here. Um, uh, so men opening door for another, uh, for women and not vice versa. Women not offer opening doors for men, but standing there and waiting for the door to be open. So this could have different intentions behind it, different meanings, different consequences. If someone objects the, to the practice of men routinely doing this, it's not sufficient to reply that men don't intend to be sexist and they don't intend to treat women as weak and in need of assistance when they perform it. But that, but that is inadequate. You can't say, oh, I'm not doing any of those things. I'm not being sexist. I'm not treating women this way, because, even though you don't intend to do it, because intention doesn't make a practice what it is. Your intention kind of doesn't matter. Okay. So on this approach, neither social practices nor social relations need be transparent. I may not understand the nature of my relations with others and may actually misunderstand our relationship. For example, I may think of the group I'm part of to be united by virtue of being God's chosen people and so perform those actions because God requested them. But there may be no God, and even if there is, God may not have established a special covenant with any group or asked that you perform this particular ritual. 
but the social group or the social practice, the, the idea is that they could ex exist in spite of these beliefs being false. In fact, an explanatory social theory may explicitly debunk social self-understandings by re-describing our social relations in term that the participants would reject. Okay, so the point here is that there's a conception of a social practice where it's all about what you intend. And what I'm saying is that from the point of view of social critic, that's not gonna be so good. Because what we wanna do is say, you don't really know what's going on in that practice. You think that this is what's going on, but it's not. But on the other hand, we should also be wary of a view that takes social practices to be just any regularity in behavior or interaction, because the postulation of something as a practice plays an explanatory role. Why do men keep opening the doors for women, but not vice versa? The answer is an explanation by saying, because it is our practice. To identify something of an instance of a practice is to situate it within a web of social meanings that function to coordinate our behavior around resources. The interpretation, as I just pointed, however, is open to contestation. So when you say this is a practice, you're explaining what the person is doing. You're not just repeating that there's a regularity. And but that explanation is situating that behavior in a pattern that is going to draw on certain meanings and understandings and certain consequences and certain distributions of resources. So it's to situate that particular action in that web. Okay, so here's the, where I'm trying to bring it together and then I'm going to give uh, my example. So practices consist of interdependent schemas and resources, quote, when they mutually and imply and sustain each other over time and sets of interdependent practices constitute structures. So schemas are gonna be the array of social meanings, concepts, symbols, scripts, tropes, et cetera, that provide the tools of culture and they they are guiding us in the distribution of the resources, and there's this looping interdependence between the two. So I suggest we use the term cultural techne for the schematic aspect of a structure, which is a web of practices, and I suggest that we use the term ideology for those cultural technes that sustain, that create, that are constituents of unjust social structures, Note, I use the term ideology here in the pejorative sense. There are other senses. Okay, so the structure, remember transportation systems or you know, other kinds of systems, there's gonna be a web of you know, tools and tropes and scripts, but they're interconnected and that's gonna be the techne. All right, so now I'm gonna go through the example. So, given the account I've just sketched, I would propose that racism is constituted by an interconnected web of unjust social practices that unjustly disadvantage certain racial groups. They include, for example, residential segregation, police brutality, buyers tiring and wage inequity, educational disadvantage, et cetera. These are not random practices, but are connected by a racist techne. And due to the looping effects that connect agents, meanings, and material conditions, the racist techne is both a source of racism, a source of perpetuating these, but also it's a product because it gets confirmed by the very structures that it creates. So let's consider, and that's confusing, so I'm gonna say something about that. It's confusing, how can, it, how can it be both the source and the, co and the consequence? Um, consider the question, what explains enduring racial inequality or injustice? What, what explains that? And I think, I mean, I think what, when we ask what explains racial inequality, typically we say racism, but we don't really know what that means. So this is, I think, what it means. Know that practices are what distribute things of value and disvalue. Toxic waste is dumped in poor black neighborhoods and good schools are built in the white suburbs. Of course, these practices are not arbitrary. There's no surprise where the good stuff ends up. But the distribution of goods doesn't end up how it does because of what most people believe for it's just as true that individuals share racist beliefs because they live in a world in which certain groups get the good stuff, right? So, so I believe, so, so you know, the racist believes that you no, know, black blacks are ignorant because because 
the racist looks around and sees, wow, look how ignorant they are coming out of those crappy schools in the inner city. And then you say, yeah, but, and so they say, yeah, see, look at them. They're ignorant. Look where are they And then you say, well, well, yeah, but those structures of poor, of crappy schools in the inner cities and such like that was the product of the very beliefs that are being confirmed by it. I mean, that they're confirming. This is making sense. Okay, you know what I'm saying. That you've got the beliefs cause the stuff and then the stuff goes and seems to confirm the beliefs. Okay, so the distribution of, um, yeah, so we learn about race and what different races deserve, quote, by looking around us. So this suggests in the, in the box, in the, the little picture, that racial inequality is a systematic phenomenon best understood in terms of a dynamic homeostasis. Consider a homeostatic system, such as a stick and a stream, held against a rock by the backwash. So see the picture, and that, that's a dam actually in the picture, but let's suppose it's a rock, and you have a, a stick flowing down the stream, and it comes to that rock, and because of the backwash, it gets sucked under. So it never makes it over, right? It just gets sucked under and up, and it gets sucked under and up. Now, there are various kinds of things that could destabilize that system. You could have a thunderstorm upstream, and the water is flowing over the top, and it doesn't get sucked down, and the stick gets by. You could have also that, you know, the, the spring runoff could move where the rock is, etc. But as the system, you know, in its stable state, it's going to keep perpetuating the, the stick staying on one side of the rock and not floating downstream. Um, Ecosystems are homeostatic systems. Our bodies are homeostatic systems. If you look homeostatic system on Google, it always gives body temperature, the uh, capacity to regulate body temperature. And plausibly, any stable society is a, dy a dynamic homeostasis. The economy, the culture, the geographic conditions, the food supply, the legal system, transportation systems, etc., function to enable individuals to coordinate, and so it is sustained. Right? And if there's an adjustment, you know, if something weird happens here, there's a kind of equilibrium that we return to because it's a coordination system. The system is stable but dynamic. Changes in climate or laws or the economy can prompt development. The adjustments in response to changes in one part don't always return the system exactly to the original state, but allow for changes in the terms of coordination. There are multiple determinants of social stratification in society, wealth, status, prestige, power, authority, autonomy, opportunity, to name a two. And in a stratified society, there are mechanisms that stably position groups hierarchically along these dimensions. Homeostasis explains the persistence of hierarchy. Changes in part of the system are adjusted for elsewhere, so the status quo is maintained. It is dynamic, though relatively stable. For example, in the case of African Americans, Slavery evolved into Jim Crow segregation, which evolved in current, the current hierarchy maintained by mass incarceration, felonization, ghettoization, economic marginalization, and cultural stigma. Okay, conclusion. Practices are a crucial phenomenon to understand racial injustice and injustice more broadly. Racial injustice, racial injustice, and these more broadly. They're constitutive of social agency. They enable coordination around things of value and are the site for social intervention and change. An account of social practices in terms of interdependent schemas and resource, resources, such as the one I've just offered, illuminates how individual behavior, culture, and other economic, legal, and physical determinants of social life are interdependent in ways that explains their stability but also indicates sites and opportunities for change. Thank you.